our first event, what we call part one, in a three-part series called The Future of Public Space. The idea came from a chat with Yudisa and in particular Michael De Beer. Each of us and our organizations and institutes had worked in different ways around public space. We're doing work with different kinds of entities. We just wanted to keep the conversation going and learn from others, keep our minds open. And so instead of keeping the knowledge to ourselves, we really wanted to open up to the public as much as possible. And one will focus on control and ownership. One will focus on activism and appropriation. Today we thought we'd focus on African cities in public space. Um, I'd like to hand over to our first presenter for the evening, Barbara Southworth, who has an extensive bio from GAP Architects and Urban Designers. Her presentation will look a bit back and a bit forward, uh, looking at Cape Town's public space from the 1980s to today. And I love her, her title, it's called Public Space in Cape Town, 1980s to Today, Who Cares? Hi everybody, friends and friends. I suppose 1980s is because that's when I first came to Cape Town and started to connect with it, and in specifically the city. So what I'm going to just run through is 38 slides and try and tell a story about public space in Cape Town as I've experienced it and the attempt to make it, own it and at the moment to break it, <laughs> um, which is what I'm seeing. So way back in the 40s was this idea of, of the city beautiful and the idea that public space was a civic thing and this actually has a lot of similarities to um, the plans that um, Hitler had drawn up by um, Albert Speer. Yeah. <laughs> Very much about the space, not much about the people. But that was part of what was in the mindsets and headspaces of the people in the 1940s when the foreshore freeway or the foreshore re reclamation was happening and space was being made in a conscious way in Cape Town. Um, maybe you could argue for the first time because unconsciously space had already been made in the form of Green Market Square and other spaces. But this was this idea of actually making space in a very formalistic way. Where did that end up? Being uh, co-opted by the proponents of the Foreshore Freeway, um, which in the end, if you read all of the stories and their backstories and the analyses, you'll find was went ahead, basically a very effective way to start getting people out of District 6. It helped, it assisted with those, the forced removals of District 6. And it became, from that city beautiful idea, to something, became something very much about cars and about separating cars from people and se separating levels and the beginning of a very tragic period for certainly the center of Cape Town. What was happening at the same time as the forced removals of District 6, the Black people of Cape Town were recognized as permanent residents. They all had temporary permits and were accordingly housed in temporary shelters, which of course, as we know, were never such a thing and became family accommodation really quickly and super overcrowded and are very much part of the fabric of Cape Town today. But that was what was happening while the Foreshore freeways were being developed and people were being removed from District 6. And then in the 1980s, there were a few forward-thinking people that came back from places like Toronto and other places and tried to start to make public space again. And one of those mo movements, if you, if you like, was the greening of the city process and the CBD pedestrianization initiative, uh, directed um, quite uh, heavily by the city of Cape Town. And the result of that is the St. George's Mall of today, um, and Tibalt Square and the upgrading of Green Market Square. But those was, that were some of the first instances after this decimation of Cape Town and the, the reclaiming of it or the claiming of the Cape Town CBD by the car and the casting out of people from the CBD and the public spaces into the, the townships and the hostels was the first attempt at trying to take that St. George's Mall in the 1920s and the 1970s, a place of cars, um, and uh, these were some of the illustrations that were done and the drawings that were done about trying to claim back space um, from cars for people. And I think we owe a debt, I certainly, uh, in, in the work that we did subsequently on the public space program for Cape Town, owe a debt of gratitude to the groundbreaking work that was done, the fights that were fought with retailers about how they would lose business because they wouldn't have cars parked in front of them, are fights that are still held today 
in trying to make public space happen. So that's St. George's Wall now, a place for everybody, more or less, as long as you obey the security guards of the city improvement district. And then there was what happened in the DNA, which in its own way, while it was incredibly um, uh, gentrified, it was a gentrification of public space, it made space for people of Cape Town. It was always the, the, the motto of the DNA was um, a place for tourists, but a place also for the citizens of Cape Town. But the reality of it was that it was a gated place that was shielding, turning its back on, this, on, on the city, and you can tell that from the way the drawings were drawn. It was an enclosed place. It was about um, creating safety and security, but it did start to set a precedent in the minds of people in Cape Town that public space could actually be cool, and public space could be a place for everywhere. And when we started in the 2000s, having done a plan for Cape Town, which envisaged a completely different future, uh, Rashik's little uh, slides about how many people owned the Cape Town, the, the Seapoint Promenade, was, was one of the underlying kind of motivations of that program. There's a department for parks, there's a department for roads, there's a department for uh, community facilities. None of them talk to each other. And none of them give a hoot about the public environment, especially in the poorest, most deprived parts of Cape Town. And so having done the spatial development framework, we thought, well, what can we, where's a space where we can fit in that's nobody's turf, but is also everybody's turf? So we set out to try and tell a story about Cape Town and the haves and the have-nots and the beautiful public spaces of the DNA and the environment with, in which the average Cape Townian was being expected to live and then the sort of suburban, the, 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 the bucolic suburbia of, of the wealthy. And those two contrasting pictures and, and try to find a way through public space and the Dignified Places program to recognize that people in poor communities also need to sit somewhere, as Rashik said. They need to play somewhere and they need to live out their lives somewhere that isn't just inside their tiny little house or shack or overpopulated, overcrowded uh, hostel unit. And at the same time, rich people also needed public space because of the kind of appalling environments that were being made. I had the misfortune of driving around down Sandown Road on Saturday. It's absolutely awful and I'd be terrified if I ever got stuck there late at night because it's completely unsurveyed, it's completely fenced, it's an absolutely terrifying environment to be in. And those kinds of environments are also pretty terrifying. Imagine if you're stuck in the car parking space in the far corner and the shops are shut and it's, it's, it's 8 o'clock at night. I'd be nervous. I'd be running. And so even the rich weren't exactly being privileged in the way in which we were making spaces. So we did this plan for Cape Town, and I'm not going to, I've only I've really been flashed five minutes, so I'm going to hurry up. But the logic of it was how can we change Cape Town by thinking about the most important spaces, the places where people spend time, where they get in and out of cars, where they get in and out of buses, off and on trains, and how can we use <clears throat> the only thing that no department in the city is, is terribly interested in is the public environment to start to change that. So what's the beginning? Where people get off and on public transport, and how do we start to make public space, and then follow that with the way public in institutions and private sector development can uh, reinforce that to make Cape Town better through what we at that stage called urban acupuncture. And so the, the point of that was to contribute to a process of urban renewal. There were urban, urban renewal programs actively happening at the same time. I don't want to discount those. This wasn't the only show in town, but this, was, this, is, what, this is what was going on in terms of public space. Um, and to start to create positive, beautiful spaces where ordinary people of all communities could start to feel a sense of dignity and pride and hope. Um, we also tried to make them intentionally a lever for integration between departments, where we discovered to our horror that, for example, a roads worker would quite happily take a piece of uh, their street over the street and throw it into something that they knew to be designated POS, because then it would be the problem of the parks department, and then they wouldn't have to haul it off, the depot, off to the depot. And the reality is that out there in the public environment, people don't care. People don't know. People don't care which department is responsible. They just want their public environments to work. And that's what we were trying to do. So we got into an enormous amount of trouble with the sector departments for messing with their silos and making them have to talk to each other. We got kind of cooperation agreements that you'd be responsible for that. And 
Uh, parks would be responsible for that, and community services would agree to take down that fence to try and make a whole of the public environment um, for our society. Um, we also got heavily criticized by the, um, this institution for not having adequate, adequately programmed the spaces, and, and probably there's an element of truth in that. And I think the VPUU has done a much better job than we did um, in, in, at that time. But this um, was, was trying to do something new inside the organization. And it was to try and take limited, limited resources, take the little bit of money that economic development had for a trader stall, and the little bit of money that parks had for three trees, and the little bit of money that roads had to do a taxi rank, and turn it into something magical and beautiful that held them all together. So that was part of what we were trying to do, and we were trying to promote those principles and trying to find a way to turn the places in which people spend their time, basically transform them from that to the, well, from that to that, which is a place where there could be some dignity, where there could be, and this was the case. We did some of these um, all over Cape Town. Um, and try to try make a difference, and try to change the way that um, public investment was made into the um, public environment in the city of Cape Town. Then there was the VPUU, which I think is worth. It's, it's really important to mention because I think they brought a whole new dimension, which we didn't have, which was the way in which they engaged people from the very outset. We did have extensive engagement processes, and those of you who are in the room who helped us implement some of those projects, know how many public meetings we sat in in Philippi and Kailicha and Langa and uh, Manenberg. But I think the way in which the evidence-based methodologies that the VPUs have used is, is really quite remarkable and I think contributes to some of their um, success, what they've done. And then there's the 2010, kind of coming up to present day, um, the World Cup, focus on the Fan Mile, the Greenpoint Park, there was the efforts around the My City, and there's been this focus now on big catalytic projects and the CBD regeneration focusing on public land release by largely the provincial but not only the provincial departments. And then there's been this private sector boom. And what we're seeing, this is just some of those NFT projects, it was an up upgrading of Haderfeld Station, Again, befores and afters, where public space was that was trying to hold everything together. This one of my favourite legacies, I think, from the World World Cup was the fan mile and a transformation of Artacan Street from that to that into a real people place. I think. But where are we now? Who's making public space now? We're doing some renovation and some upgrading a little bit here and there. There's, I think, there are civic movements trying to. Uh, open streets, there's the, um, the, 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 the co-design workshops, the sort of aftermath of the world design capital, but it actually is fizzled and it's faded. And I don't see anybody taking responsibility for the public environment out on Cape Flats. I see developers cottoning on to the fact that great quality public space is what makes them an extra buck. This development over here is called the Matrix in Century City. The 155 units at 32,000 rand square meters sold out in two hours. This, again, Century City, is they're, they're making money hand over fist as a result of understanding the value of public space. And what I don't have are the images that were taken recently by one of, one of my colleagues. What those public spaces look like that are often the Cape Flats. They are degraded, unmaintained. The lawns in the park down the road from me in Seapoint. Are being, are being mowed by the Parks Department of the City of Cape Town. Those trees for people who have nothing, no swimming pool, no garden, are standing chopped down, the paving is falling apart. And so I suppose my question to the panel for us to discuss is, is who cares enough to make public space happen? Um, who cares enough to participate in the process of it? And who cares enough to maintain and sustain it beyond the private sector? Um, private sector developers. Thanks. <laughs> Le use mucho chaval que me ha dicho que